But so, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed reports. Yes, we came, that. we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. <laughs>
they would be able to keep their money inside their local, you know, uh, country. And that's really where all the power is. It's local. It's not when you, uh, you know, uh, submit to these central bankers. That's why local currencies are so powerful. According to some, it's about protecting civilians. We must not tolerate this regime using military force against its own people. Others say it's about oil. The only reason they're interested in, with Libya is about the oil. You'd think we'd be in Iraq if the major export there was broccoli. But some are convinced intervention in Libya is all about currency, specifically Gaddafi's plan to introduce the gold dinar, a single African currency made from gold, a true sharing of the wealth. It's one of these things that you have to plan almost in secret, because as soon as you say you're going to change over from the dollar to the something else, you're going to be targeted. There were two conferences on this. One in 96 uh, and another one in the year 2000, called the World Mataba Conference, organized by Gaddafi. And uh, everybody was interested, and I think most countries in Africa were keen. Gaddafi didn't give up. In the months leading up to the military intervention, he called on African and Muslim nations to join together to create this new currency that would rival the dollar and euro. They would sell oil and other resources around the world only for gold dinars. It's an idea that would shift the economic balance of the world. Countries' wealth would depend on how much gold they have, not how many dollars they trade. And Libya has 144 tonnes of gold. The UK has double that, but 10 times the population. If Gaddafi uh, had an intent to try to uh, reprice his oil or whatever else the, uh, the country was uh, selling in the global markets and accept something else as a currency or maybe launch a gold in our currency, any move such as that would certainly not be welcomed by the power elite today who are responsible for controlling the world's central banks. So yes, that would certainly be something that would cause his immediate dismissal and the need for other reasons to, uh, to be brought forth for removing him from power. It's happened before. In 2000, Saddam Hussein announced Iraqi oil would be traded in euros, not dollars. Sanctions and an invasion followed. Some say because the Americans were desperate to prevent OPEC from transferring oil trading in all its member countries to the euro. The UK's gold is kept here in a secure vault somewhere in the depths of the Bank of England. As in most developed countries, there's not enough to go around. But that's not the case in places like Libya and many of the Gulf states. A gold dinar would have given oil-rich African and Middle Eastern countries the power to turn around to their energy-hungry customers and say, sorry, the price has gone up and we want gold. Some say the US and its NATO allies literally couldn't afford to let that happen. Alan Cooperman, a professor of public affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also an author and among his works, this book, The Limits of Humanitarian Intervention. And Alan, I know that you've written a lot about this, and something that you said was that the U.S. involvement in Libya is not only not preventing murder and suffering, but that it's in fact causing suffering by innocent people and also prolonging the civil war in Libya. Where is your evidence of this? Well, my, my evidence is, is that the claim that was made by the Obama administration. Muammar Gaddafi clearly lost the confidence of his own people and the legitimacy to lead. Instead of respecting the rights of his own people, Gaddafi chose the path of brutal suppression. Ample warning was given that Gaddafi needed to stop his campaign of repression or be held accountable. The Arab League and the European Union joined us in calling for an end to violence. Just yesterday, speaking of the city of Benghazi, a a city of roughly 700,000 people. He threatened, and I quote, we will have no mercy and no pity. Now here's why this matters to us. Left unchecked, we have every reason to believe that Gaddafi would commit atrocities against his people. Many thousands could die. A humanitarian crisis would ensue. The entire region could be destabilized, endangering many of our allies and partners. 
And that's why the United States has worked with our allies and partners to shape a strong international response at the United Nations. Now, once more, Muammar Gaddafi has a choice. The resolution that passed lays out very clear conditions that must be met. The United States, the United Kingdom, France, and Arab states agree that a ceasefire must be implemented immediately. That means all attacks against civilians must stop. Gaddafi must stop his troops from advancing on Benghazi, pull them back from Ajubia, Misrata, and Zawiya, and establish water, electricity, and gas supplies to all areas. Humanitarian assistance must be allowed to reach the people of Libya. Let me be clear. These terms are not negotiable. These terms are not subject to negotiation. If Gaddafi does not comply with the resolution, the international community will impose consequences, and the resolution will be enforced through military action. The United States is prepared to act as part of an international coalition. American leadership is essential, but that does not mean acting alone. I've taken this decision with the confidence that action is necessary and that we will not be acting alone. Our goal is focused, our cause is just, and our coalition is strong. That there was going to be a bloodbath, that there was going to be even genocidal violence, that uh, Gaddafi was deliberately, intentionally massacring civilians. My evidence is that there is no evidence of that in the other cities that uh, Gaddafi has captured, either totally or partially. And the latest data comes actually from Human Rights Watch. And what they found is that uh, the victims in Misrata, which is the third biggest city in Libya, only 3% of the wounded are women. And what that tells you is that uh, the violence by Qaddafi's forces is not indiscriminate. It's actually quite targeted. It's targeted at fighters because the fighters are male. If Qaddafi were trying to massacre civilians, there would be thousands killed, not a couple hundred killed in Misrata. And if he were indiscriminately targeting civilians, then about half the victims would be women, not 3%. So uh, my concern is that there was no bloodbath ongoing. There was no bloodbath likely uh, in Benghazi. And uh, instead, the civil war essentially was going to be over a month ago. But then NATO intervened, led by the United States. And what that has done is sort of level the playing field. It's prolonged the civil war. T cities in the center of Libya on the coast have now changed hands two, three, four times. Every time they change hands, they're shelling from both sides and the civilians that are caught in the middle. So we didn't stop a bloodbath, but we are prolonging and perpetuating the suffering of civilians in Libya, in my opinion. But, Alan, I've got to point out here, I mean, uh, you know, maybe that some of these places that you point to that Gaddafi's forces do actually have a uh, control in, uh, there's been targeted killings of these armed rebels, but the fact is we can't ignore that this is a man who said in a speech on television, you know, that he th was going to search every home and find people in their closets. So, you know, unlike, for example, Iraq and this false claim of weapons of mass destruction, here you have a leader who's actually saying, you know, by the way, I am going to come out and, and drag people out of their homes and kill them. And I know that, um, you know, this is something that Obama pointed to in his speech in terms of why we got involved in Libya. Let me play a little bit of what President Obama said, and then I'll have you respond. Sure. We knew that if we wanted, if we waited one more day, Benghazi, a city nearly the size of Charlotte, could suffer a massacre that would have reverberated across the region and stained the conscience of the world. So again, you know, President Obama pointing to this threat made by Gaddafi himself. Um, do you think that you, the U.S. and France and Great Britain, do you think that they should have just ignored Gaddafi as a madman? Well, I mean, I think if you actually listen to what Gaddafi said, he said that he would show no mercy to rebels. But he said that he would show mercy if the rebels gave up the fight, gave up their weapons. So he was very clearly saying he was going to target fighters. He made clear he was not going to target civilians. He wouldn't even target rebels who surrendered. 
So, um, and he was clear about this. So it seems to me that President Obama exaggerated the threat. Um, he exaggerated what Gaddafi said. In fact, misrepresented what Gaddafi uh, had said. And so, would you know? Would there have been some killing? Yes, there would have been some been some killing in Benghazi. But uh, the civil war essentially would have ended. The rebels were on the run. They were in mass retreat, and the war would have ended in March. And instead, here we are uh, in the second half of April, and the war is ongoing. And uh, people are suffering every single day. So, as I say, I don't think we stopped the bloodbath, but I think we have perpetuated the war. And my rough guess at this point is that we've actually increased the net suffering uh, to civilians in Libya. That certainly wasn't the intention. And the only question for me then is, um, you know, why did Obama do this? Did he get tricked by the rebels who claimed that there was going to be a genocide? Or was he sort of in on that, uh, sort of a co-conspirator, exaggerating with the rebels the threat of a genocide in order to launch an intervention for other purposes? You know, of course, it's hard to say, though, Alan. You know, what would have happened, could have happened, uh, should have happened if the U.S. and, and NATO forces uh, uh, you know, didn't get involved. Uh, you know, we just can't know because the fact is, a month ago we did get involved. But I know you also said uh, that we should intervene no further until Gaddafi's forces actually prove that they're going to massacre civilians. Um, a lot of people would just find that claim a little rough to swallow um, to say, you know, let's wait until thousands of people are already killed until, until we get involved. Now, that's, 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 that's not what I say. What, you know, my, my argument is based on over a decade's worth of research. I've done research on the ground in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Rwanda. I've also researched Darfur, Iraq, Afghanistan. And what you find is that rebels often use the same propaganda tactic. They start a war that they cannot win on their own. And the whole goal is to drag in the United States and its allies on their side. And the only way to get the U.S. to come in on their side is to claim that the government is going to massacre civilians. They did it in Bosnia, and it worked. They did it in Kosovo, it worked. And so my point is, if you're really trying to save civilians, what you should do is not play this rebel game. You should say to the rebels, if you start a rebellion and the government responds by targeting rebels, we're not going to get involved. The only time that the West and the international community should get involved is if the government responds grossly disproportionately, if the government actually starts targeting civilians intentionally. Then the international sh community should come in to stop a bloodbath, to stop uh, a genocidal type situation. So that was my recommendation, is that so long as Gaddafi is mainly targeting rebels, the United States should not be intervening there. And we should be using the potential of intervention and say, we would intervene if you start targeting civilians, and that would deter Gaddafi from targeting civilians. And the evidence so far is that Gaddafi is not targeting civilians. As I said, 3% of the victims are women. It shows that Gaddafi is targeting mainly rebels. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, the government of Libya announced the death of Muammar Gaddafi. This marks the end of a long and painful chapter for the people of Libya, who now have the opportunity to determine their own destiny in a new and democratic Libya. For four decades, the Gaddafi regime ruled the Libyan people with an iron fist. Basic human rights were denied. Innocent civilians were detained beaten and killed, and Libya's wealth was squandered. Gaddafi nationalized key sectors of the oil resources and negotiated fairer prices within OPEC for oil producing countries. He used the oil revenues to build schools, universities, hospitals, and much needed infrastructure. Before Gaddafi, fewer than one-fifth of Libyans were literate, no access to education for the majority of people, and then after Gaddafi, free quality education system, including university, and the literacy rate rose to 83%. Libya has free health care. All people, including the rebels, have access to doctors, hospitals, clinics, and medicines free of charge. If a Libyan needs surgery that is unavailable in Libya, funding is provided for the surgery to be carried out overseas. Soon after the revolution, basic food items were subsidized and electricity was made available throughout the country. 
huge irrigation projects were established in order to support a drive towards agriculture development and self-sufficiency in food production. Gaddafi initiated the construction of the Great Man-Made River, referred to in the Guinness Book of Records as a wonder of the modern world. This gigantic river has managed to turn the coastal desert green. In its early days, skeptics called it the Great Madman's River, a reference to the Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi and its enormous expense, billions of dollars. Any Libyan who wanted to become a farmer was, and still is, given free use of land, a house, farm equipment, livestock, and seeds. Gaddafi vowed to house every Libyan, many of whom were still living in tents and houses made out of oil drums. He also vowed that his own parents, who lived in a tent, would not be housed until every Libyan was housed. His mother had only one complaint. Her son insists that they remain in their tent until every Libyan is properly housed. He fulfilled that promise, his own father dying before he had the opportunity to move him into a home. Large-scale housing construction took place right across the country, all Libyans being given a house or apartment to live in for free. Under the leadership of Gaddafi, Libya has attained the highest standard of living in Africa, rated on the UN's HDI ahead of Russia, Brazil, and Saudi Arabia. In 2007, in an article which appeared in the African Executive magazine, it was noted that Libya, unlike other oil-producing countries such as Nigeria, utilized the revenue from its oil to develop its country. Gaddafi believes that economic democracy can only be achieved when the GDP of a country benefits all of its citizens and when the country's wealth is dispersed to every single citizen. Today, money from Libya's oil revenue is directly deposited into the bank account of every Libyan. Gaddafi is dedicated to the emancipation of Libyan women, encouraging them to participate in all aspects of political life. The revolution ensured that women gained full access to education and has actively encouraged acceptance of female paid employment. Libya is a very traditional society, and these moves by Gaddafi have been met with stiff resistance, especially by the forces in Benghazi. He opposed the U.S. invasion of Iraq and condemned those Arab leaders who supported the so-called Coalition of the Willing, earning the wrath of the Saudi monarchy when he said that the Kaaba was under the yoke of American occupation and questioned what meaning the Hajj has for Muslims as long as the American occupation of the sacred house of God continues. In October of 2010, Gaddafi was the first and only leader in the Arab world to formally apologize for the Arab role in the trade and capture of Africans. This infuriated Arab leaders disgruntled with the arrogance of the Arab leaders and the continual thorn in their side as he openly criticized their hypocrisy and servitude to Western imperialism, Gaddafi became isolated in the Arab world. He called on the African Union to give representation to Africans in the U.S., Europe, the Caribbean, and South America. In a recent speech, he said, from now on, by the will of God, I will assign teams to search, investigate, and liaise with the Africans in Europe, and to check their situation. This is my duty and role towards the sons of Africa. I am a soldier for Africa. I am here for you, and I work for you. Therefore, I will not leave you, and I will follow up on your conditions. One of Gaddafi's most controversial and difficult moves has been his determined drive to unite Africa with a shared vision for the true independence and liberation of the entire continent. He has contributed a great deal of his time, energy, and large sums of money to this project. When war broke out in Uganda, the Congo, Ethiopia, and Eritrea, Gaddafi negotiated ceasefires part of his long-held dream of creating a unified continent called the United States of Africa. While the Libyan Revolution has irritated the West since its inception, and although they never forgave Gaddafi for nationalizing Libya's oil, 
The most worrying move has been his call for the unification of Africa. After years of tireless effort on the part of Gaddafi and the Libyan revolutionary movements, the idea of a United States of Africa is gaining real momentum and support on the continent. In 1982, the world Mathaba was established in Libya. Mathaba means a gathering place for people with a common purpose. The world Mathaba brought together revolutionaries and freedom fighters from every corner of the globe to share ideas and develop their revolutionary knowledge. Many liberation groups received education, training, and support from Libya. These are just some of the groups that Gaddafi has helped. And because of his support, Gaddafi has been labeled a terrorist. Nelson Mandela called Gaddafi one of the 20th century's greatest freedom fighters and insisted the eventual collapse of the apartheid system owed much to Gaddafi and Libyan support. Mandela said that, in the darkest moments of our struggle, when our backs were to the wall, Muammar Gaddafi stood with us. The enormous potential of the Libyan people was held back and terror was used as a political weapon. Today we can definitively say that the Gaddafi regime has come to an end. The last major regime strongholds have fallen. The new government is consolidating the control over the country, and one of the world's longest serving dictators is no more. One year ago, the notion of a free Libya seemed impossible, but then the Libyan people rose up and demanded their rights. And when Gaddafi and his forces started going city to city, town to, by town, to brutalize men, women, and children, the world refused to stand idly by. Faced with the potential of mass atrocities and a call for help from the Libyan people, the United States and our friends and allies stopped Gaddafi's forces in their tracks a coalition that included the United States, NATO, and Arab nations persevered through the summer to protect Libyan civilians. And meanwhile, the courageous Libyan people fought for their own future and broke the back of the regime. So this is a momentous day in the history of Libya. The dark shadow of tyranny has been lifted, and with this enormous promise, the Libyan people now have a great responsibility to build an inclusive, and tolerant and democratic Libya that stands as the ultimate rebuke to Gaddafi's dictatorship. We look forward to the announcement of the country's liberation, the quick formation of an interim government, and a stable transition to Libya's first free and fair elections. And we call on our Libyan friends to continue to work with the international community to secure dangerous materials, and to respect the human rights of all Libyans, including those who've been detained. Uh, we're under no illusions. Libya will travel a long and winding road to full democracy. There will be difficult days ahead. But the United States, together with the international community, is committed to the Libyan people. You have won your revolution. And now we will be a partner as you forge a future that provides dignity, freedom, an opportunity. Bubaka Samba left Gambia 11 months ago, hoping to find a better life in Europe. He paid smugglers to get him to Tripoli in Libya in order to cross the Mediterranean. But before he reached Tripoli, the armed traffickers demanded more money. First place you read that, they will tell you to call your family or you to pay the money to their collection. So they will keep you there, waste your time. They will not give you a chance to go out to know the town, what is going on in town. So what they will press you to call your people for them to pay the money. And the price will for them the price they will tell you and the price they are not the same. Unable to pay the smugglers, Samba was held captive and forced to work to make up the money. Saba to Tripoli is fifteen thousand in Gambian dollars. But they will tell you that twenty five thousand. Thanks to an operation by the International Organization for Migration, Samba and another 168 Gambians are safely back home. So I just come home like that. 
with nothing. But you know that the family, they are not expecting me. So I even came, my stepmom cried. Because he didn't expect me, I will come back to Gambia. Because the way, by then I'm living here, I have the intention to go to Europe and live a good life and help the family. That is my mission to leave my country. So when I come home with empty pocket. West African migrants interviewed by the IOM have recounted being bought and sold in garages and car parks in Sabha. It's just like a slavery is running in Libya for the blacks. They say slavery is finished, but they say, oh. Slavery is existing in Libya every day and night. They sell people just like the way they sell goats and rams. They will price you, you are sitting. You cannot do nothing there. The IOM says migrants are sold for between 200 and 500 dollars, and some are held captive for two to three months. The United Nations says growing numbers of African migrants passing through Libya are being sold as slaves by traffickers or militia groups before being held for ransom. The UN's migration agency interviewed West African migrants who told of being bought and sold in garages and car parks in the southern city of Saba, one of Libya's main migrant smuggling hubs. The head of the UN agency's Libya mission gave more details at a news conference in Geneva. If you go to the market and you can pay between two and five hundred dollars to get a migrant that will work with you uh, on your daily jobs or support your work. After you buy, this, this person is handed over to you again, then it becomes your responsibility. Many of them escape, many of them are kept in bondage, and many of them are even prisoned inside uh, an area where they are forced to, to work on a daily basis. There are also claims that women have been bought in Libya and forced to be sex slaves. The new evidence suggests that slave markets are becoming much more open, trapping sub-Saharan migrants who cross the desert heading for Europe. The UN is helping some of them to return home. Well, for more, Nicole Johnston joins me now live in the studio. She spent an extensive amount of time in Libya. And Nicole, it's, just, it's absolutely shocking what's being revealed here because it almost sounds like the slave trade of centuries ago with people openly being sold in public markets. Is it that blatant? It's not quite that blatant. I'll just explain the process. What's happening is we have, you know, tens of thousands of migrants from West Africa leaving their homes. They travel to Niger to a town called Agadez. From there they meet up with the people smugglers. They head off across the Sahara. Most of them have no idea what they're in for when they reach Libya. They've got no idea how bad the situation is. When you're in Niger, and we were there last year, we spoke to a lot of these migrants who'd been in Libya, had a hell of a time and had then returned. And they did tell us about these sorts of things. But the way it happens is once they get to Libya, most of them have run out of money. So they then need to call their families at home to try and get more money. If they don't have any money, if they can't reach the families, they're held in these detention centres and that's what the report talks about. In many cases they're sold from one detention centre to another detention centre. Uh, the longer they're held the higher the price goes and in some cases they're then sold on and that's when it starts to look like an actual slave market okay. uh, because they're sold on to people who then use them in manual labour and as you said in the cases of women, particularly women from uh, Nigeria, you know, they think they're going to Europe, but they end up in sort of in brothels in either Libya or in Europe. And, and yes, it's a pretty terrifying situation, but not really surprising when, when you hear the stories mm. from the migrants who've returned back to Niger who say, look, I'm giving up, I'm going to head home. Because Libya is in many ways a lawless state. Um, it's, in, it's at war. There are militias running, running various areas. Can anything be done then? to stop this trade, this practice, and beyond that, hold anyone to account? Well, I think at, at different times, people are trying to, to do something, but 
it's clearly not working. So the, the centre or the headquarters for this in Libya is the town of Subha. It's in the south. And when you speak to these migrants in Niger, they talk about, you know, it's the Wild West, it's lawless, there are gangs, militias, uh, some of them called them the asthma boys. They were terrified of them. They get beaten up by them. Uh, so that in that part of the country, in the southern part, where there's also fighting going on between uh, various forces aligned to the competing governments in Libya, until the country is stabilised, and who knows when that will be, it seems that very little can be done. But aside from that, you know, this is a transnational, international criminal operation. It's not just involving Libya. It includes Niger. It includes West African countries. It includes Europe. It's established roots. It's big business. And when you speak to the smugglers in Niger, who are a major part of this operation into Libya, they say, well, what else are we going to do? There's no other business here. It's the, the Tuareg people. There's no other trade. And they feel that they're carrying out a legitimate mm. business. They say these people want to travel and we're providing a service. Okay. Who gave coalition forces in Libya the right to eliminate Gaddafi? Well, that's the question Vladimir Putin's been asking during an official visit to Denmark. The Russian Premier also said NATO's effectively joined one of the warring sides in the conflict and more responsible action should be taken instead. Artie's Daniel Bushel joins us now live for this in Brussels. Uh, Daniel, so um, the Russian Prime Minister has effectively lashed out on the operation there in Libya. Yes, he's made the speech in Denmark and he was very angry. He says that uh, Gaddafi is not the best person in the world. Sure, he's made uh, many mistakes, done many bad things, but that does not give the coalition the right to bomb indiscriminately. His words were that they are bombing Gaddafi's palaces in Tripoli every night. Uh, now, a coalition said that their plan was not to get rid of Gaddafi. So his question was, uh, Mr. Putin's question was, why are the coalition forces obviously making this effort to go after Colonel Gaddafi himself? Now, we also heard that uh, the experts here in Brussels have confirmed that there's, there is bombing going on by the coalition forces, uh, which is not being covered by the media uh, here in the European Union. Mr. Putin added that oil was uh, a key interest for the Western powers, for the European powers who have gone into Libya, that they want to get rid of Gaddafi and install people who are more favourable to the European Union so that European companies can control the oil reserves. Let's have a listen to exactly what Mr. Putin had to say. The coalition said destroying Gaddafi was not their goal. Then why bomb his palaces? Now some officials have claimed that eliminating him was in fact their goal. Who gave them that right? Did he have a fair trial? Returning to the no-fly zone, the bombings are destroying the country's entire infrastructure. When the so-called civilised world uses all its military power against a small country, destroying what's been created by generations, I don't know if that's good. Mr Putin said that uh, they have to give the Libyan people time to sort out their own problems and there's really double standards here, here he added. Uh, there are several other parts of the region in the Middle East and North Africa which is facing pretty much civil war situations but which the West is either ignoring or not really paying the same amount of attention to. Well Daniel, there have been uh, reports about an EU plan to send army convoys to assist humanitarian aid there in Libya. Of course, there'll be those who say, well, this is really the start of uh, a military ground operation. Uh, something, of course, that uh, allies were adamant wouldn't happen. Yeah, absolutely. I heard these uh, rumours for the first time a few weeks ago uh, that the EU plans to send up to a thousand troops uh, under the guise of so-called humanitarian aid. Russia fears that this will be used uh, to plan an invasion and to carry out an invasion of Libya on the pre pretext of supporting uh, humanitarian aid to the Libyan people. The draft plan is called U for Libya. It's supported uh, by the 27 member states of the European Union, uh, prepared by them, and it provides provides for ground troops, in fact, to be deployed by the Western coalition. Uh, they, in the port city of Misrata, which is currently under siege by forces uh, loyal to Muammar Gaddafi, here in Brussels, Michael Mann, the chief spokesman to the European Union High Representative, Catherine Ashton, said that they would only send up to a thousand troops and the troops would only be used uh, if they came under attack, otherwise they would only defend aid. Now, Russia has said that it will only support another UN resolution if it 
explicitly says that it will not uh, uh, st it will not continue the violence. That if it ends the violence and starts negotiations, then that is the only condition under which they would support that. Now, I've been speaking to military analysts here in Brussels, and they confirm that uh, ground troops are already in operation in Libya. This is not being covered by the media uh, in the European Union, but uh, troops are already in operation, and they are pushing forward in Libya with Colonel Gaddafi as the target. When Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi threatened to crack down on protesters in Benghazi, the UN Security Council passed a resolution authorizing member states to take all necessary measures to protect civilians under threat of attack in the country, including Benghazi, while excluding a foreign occupation force of any form on any part of Libyan territory. Five countries, including Russia, China and Germany, abstained from voting on military action in Libya. We are standing with the people of Libya. And the people of Libya must be protected. NATO allies stand behind the legitimate aspirations of the Libyan people for freedom, democracy and human rights. After thousands of bombs and missiles hit their targets, it became clear that for NATO allies, protecting civilians in Libya meant wiping out Gaddafi's military and targeting the Libyan leader himself. A, a good day for, for you? A very good day for us. You showed the world you would get rid of a dictator and you would choose freedom. Very quickly, Libya began to plunge into chaos, with many factions fighting each other and thousands of civilians dying as a result. Islamists seized the capital, Tripoli. The country has failed to form a functional government. Libya went from being one of the richest nations in Africa to one of the most troubled. The aftermath of the conflict has been a real area of concern uh, by all uh, uh, who were parties to uh, the operations that uh, removed Gaddafi from power. It's, you know, and I think that uh, whenever you have that kind of lawless space, you see things like, uh, you know, ISIL try to establish uh, a foothold there and other uh, uh, groups, terrorist groups. Uh. ISIL has found a safe haven in the largely ungoverned and lawless post Gaddafi Libya. Five years after the U.S. helped bomb Gaddafi out of power, it's back to Libya, bombing terrorists now. In Washington, I'm Ganesh Chekyan, RT. But those new bombings, which Guyana just mentioned, still raise questions. Two Serbian diplomats kept hostage by ISIL were killed alongside terrorists in an airstrike in February carried out by the U.S. We conducted an airstrike in Libya targeting an ISIL training camp near Sabratha. This action is a clear demonstration of the Secretary's continued commitment to go after ISIL's metastases wherever they emerge. This is not the first time we have taken direct action in Libya or against other high-value ISIL targets, and it may not be the last. The airstrike was praised as a solid anti-terror effort by the Pentagon. However, Libya's internationally recognized government, sitting in the country's east, condemned the action as a clear violation of the state's sovereignty. Lou Rockwell from the Ludwig von Mises Institute believes Libya is still a long way from unity and stability. It's just chaos. and I wouldn't say it's in transition. I mean, it's just, it continues to be in a war situation. Um, it's just horrendous. People. Uh, people being killed by, in massive numbers every day, terrorists roaming wild, and uh, um, whatever one might say about the problems of Gaddafi, and he's not a good guy, needless to say. Um, he was anti-jihadist and anti-terrorist, um, and by getting rid of him, it, which is what the U.S. sought to do to cause chaos, um, to cause uh, just endless trouble. 
uh, maybe even to release all the arms that they then shipped to Syria uh, from, from Benghazi, uh, was designed to cause regime change. They didn't care how many people were killed, what kinds of oppressions took place, things far worse than under Gaddafi. So the, you know, the, the no-fly zone served its purpose, uh, but it was a bad purpose. In the east of the country, the city of Benghazi has been a key battleground between the Libyan army and rebel groups, one of which is the Islamist group Ansar al-Sharia. Ansar al-Sharia is another revolution-era militia, one growing in influence with alleged links to the Islamic State. However, they're yet to declare this officially themselves. As the civilian population suffers amongst the clashes, groups like the rebels and Ansar al-Sharia are trying to position themselves as a solution for stability. Though Benghazi is home to some Islamist brigades, there are concerned voices amongst the people, some of whom have their doubts about Islamist fighters establishing rule in the country. Ansar al-Sharia has advocated for Sharia law to be implemented in Libya and in cities like Benghazi, they're winning hearts and minds. In a post-Arab Spring era, it seems that countries like Egypt and now Libya, who had fought for their freedom from dictatorship, have been left in a violent vacuum. With instability on the rise, it appears as if some residents are looking to Islamist groups to fill the void. The UN recently warned that Libya is nearing the point of no return, and with growing support among the civilian population for radical groups like Ansar al-Sharia, it's difficult to see how this conflict will end. Did you say he should be president forever? I hope so, I wish that. Why? 
حتنقذ امريكا تنقذ العالم بيكوز ذا فيجن هي هاز ويل سيف امريكا ويل سيف ذا وورلد وثبت ان ما فيه ديمقراطيه هناك بل هناك دكتاتوريه لا تختلف ابدا عن دكتاتوريه هتلر او نابليون او موسوليني او جنكيز خان او اسكندر الى اخر الطغاة بامر رياسي يقال هكذا في عهد ريج المجنون يقال بامر رياسي اصدر الرئيس الامريكي ريج امر رياسي بالحرب على ليبيا مثلا امر رياسي بمحاصره ليبيا امر رياسي بمقاطعه ليبيا امر رياسي بعمل كذا كذا هل هذه ليست دكتاتوريه هذه ديمقراطيه الان انتخابات امريكيه طلع مواطن اسود اصله من كينيا افريقي ومسلم وكان يدرس في مدرسه اسلاميه في اندونيسيا اسمه اوباما والناس كلهم صفقوا لهذه الشخصيه في الوطن العربي وفي العالم الاسلامي وفي افريقيا واستبشروا بخير وصفقوا له وصلوا من اجله ودعوا له بالنجاح وربما يكونوا قد دخلوا حتى في حملات التبرع الشرعيه ل لتمكينه من الفوز في رئاسه امريكا. لكن فوجينا بان اخانا وشقيقنا الافريقي الكيني الامريكي الجنسيه امريكي الجنسيه يطلع بتصريحات صدمت كل مؤيديه في العالم العربي وفي افريقيا وفي العالم الاسلامي. نحن نتمنى وربما تكون هكذا ان هي مجرد زي ما يقولوا في مصر كوزيون انتخابي. هذه مناسبه انتخابيه ان كذبه انتخابيه. مش تعرفوا مهزله الانتخابات ان الواحد يكذب يكذب على الناس لكي يعطوه اصواته وبعد ياتي التطبيق وينجح يقولون له هو انت وعدت بكذا بكذا يقولون لا هذه دعايه انتخابيه شوفوا مهزله هذه ديمقراطيه لا هذه دعايه انتخابيه فاكرينها قد لكنها مضبوط نضحك عليكم يعني باخذ اصواتكم ان شاء الله هي تكون هكذا مجرد دعايه انتخابيه لكن كونك هو يقول ان القدس ساعملها عاصمة إلى الأبد للإسرائيليين هذا يدل على أنه هو أن أخانا أوباما يجهل السياسة الدولية وما هوش بطلع على الملف الصراع في الشرق الأوسط كنا نعتقد أن يقول أنا قررت إذا نجحت سوف افتش مفاعل ديمونه لاتاكد من القنابل الذريه ومن لسح لسحه الدمار الشباب الاخرى عند الاسرائيليين، نبغى نتاكد منها ويدير قرار مثل هذا. لكن لابد انه عندما فكر في هذا، لابد انه فكر. عندما كان يتكلم عن ايران برنامجه النووي، لابد ان تكون امام ديمونه بكل تاكيد. لكن لما تكون قدام ديمونه لابد ان يكون قدام يكون قدام مصير مصير سلفه كندي 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 الذي قرر ان يفتش مفاعل ديمونه واصر على تفتيش ليتاكد من انه يصنع اسلحه ذريه والا لا ورفض الاسرائيليون واخيرا اصر هو على التفتيش كان المخرج من هذه الازمه هو استقاله بن غوريون استقال حتى لا يوافق على تفتيش مفاعل ديمونه. واعطى الضوء الاخضر بقتل كندي. وهكذا قتل كندي بسبب مفاعل ديمونه واصراره على تفتيشه. بسبب اصراره على تفتيشه، قتل كندي. لابد ان اوباما امام هذه الصوره، وبالتالي لابد انه كان يريد ان يتكلم على هذا ولكنه يتراجع. كنا نتوقع منه ان يقول اني ساطبق اذا نجحت فكره الدوله الواحده اسراطين
الموجودة في الكتاب الأبيض للقذافي أن هذه الفكرة هي الفكرة اللي فيها الحل الجذري والتاريخي والنهاية وأنه مستحيل إقامة دولتين قزميتين في هذه المنطقة أي دولة عمق 15 كيلو متر ما يسمى بإسرائيل لأن عمق 15 كيلو متر أي دولة هذه أمام خمسة ملايين من الفلسطينيين كنا نتوقع أن يقول ملايين اللاجئين الفلسطينيين قررت أن أرجعهم لأرض فلسطين التي تطرد منها عام 48 وعام 67 هذا هو التغيير الذي تصفق له الشعوب ويده الشعب الأمريكي والشعب الأسود في أمريكا كنا نعتقد أن يقول أني أعمل مجلس استقلال الأمة الكردية وتوحيدها ولا بد أن تحتل في الشرق الأدنى مكانة تحت الشمس وفوق الأرض الأمة الكردية الممزقة المعذبة المضطهدة المستعمرة من الكل كان يجب يقف إلى جانبها لا يقف مع العملاء ويضحي بمصير الأمة الكردية هذا التغيير والخوف كل الخوف هو ان هذا الكلام في وقت اقول ان ان الاسود يشعر بالنقص عقده النقص هذا شيء خطير اذا كان اخونا اوباما شعر بانه هو اسود وانه ليس له الحق في نحكم امريكا هذه المصيبه الكبيره لان هذا الشعور خطير جدا يجعله يتصرف ابيض اكثر من البيض ويبالغ في اضطهاد السود واحتقاره نحن نقول له يا اخي الاسود والابيض في امريكا متساويين كلهم مهاجرين امريكا ليست للبيض ولا حتى ولا للسود امريكا للهنود الحمر سكانها الاصليين جاي الابيض وجاي الاسود اذا الابيض والاسود في امريكا متساويين ومن حق اوباما ان يرفع راسه ويقول انا شريك في امريكا امريكا ارضي مثل ما ارضكم انتم اذا كان ما ارضكم ما يش ارضي حتى انتم ليست ارضكم ارض الهنود الحمر انتم مهاجرون نحن مهاجرون لكن ما زلنا احنا نامل ان الاسود هذا يكون معتز بافريقيته وباسلامه وبعقيدته وانه صاحب حق في امريكا وان يغير امريكا من الشر الى الخير وان تقيم العلاقات we came, we saw, he died. <laughs>